much for for the introduction, Matt, and thank you very much, very much everyone for for joining us. I'm Stephen Toe. I'm the CEO of Leo Cancer Care, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about upright patient positioning in radiation therapy, and how I believe this could add some real uh, tangible benefits and answer some of those questions that might help us to reduce that radiation therapy treatment backlog. So I'm going to start just by looking at what we really mean by this backlog and putting some numbers behind it. And I'm going to be referring to the APPG letter to, to the Prime Minister Boris Johnson and also to a recent Lancet article around this radiation therapy backlog. And both of those sources suggest 40,000 missing and undiagnosed cancer patients as a result of this backlog. Uh, suggest that the mean weekly radiation therapy courses are down by around about 20 percent uh, and also suggests that four weeks of delay in cancer treatment results in a reduction in survival by an average 10 percent. So I think we can probably all agree that this is a very serious backlog that we are currently facing. But when I started to think about how to put this presentation together and started thinking in really in detail about this backlog, it really struck me that cues or backlogs are something that we face in our lives uh, every day as it is. And especially now that travel is starting to open up again, this is a sight that we see fairly often. We see these kind of cues in airports. So is there anything that we can learn from the way that we deal with other backlogs and apply that to radiation therapy? And if we consider the way that we deal with these queues in airports, what we would do is either open up more booths so that we've got more people checking passports. We would reduce the amount of security, the amount of questions asked um, but for each individual. Or what we could do is just give the guards that are sat there uh, coffee and ask them to work faster or you know better still we could do all three of those things so brilliant I'm clearly a genius I'm coming along and I'm saying the solution to this problem don't worry about it is just let's have more machines is that what I'm saying actually that's not what I'm saying and I think we need to think about it in a little bit more detail uh, and if we stick with this analogy for a second of, of queues in airports the idea of just let's build more machines or let's put more people into these booths doesn't really work or isn't the most effective way of doing things. If you imagine that you had two terminals there, Terminal 1 and Terminal 2, if you had a big queue of people in Terminal 1, but you had no people there queuing in Terminal 2, does it make sense to just more, put more people on if you put them all in Terminal 2? Well, no, that doesn't solve your problem. You could have all of these people down here in Terminal 2, but your queue is still there and your problem is still there in Terminal 1. So I think this applies to radiation therapy as well. It's more about how do we improve the distribution of radiation therapy rather than just how do we increase the number of units? And especially when hyperfractionation comes into play, and I'll come on to that a little bit later on as well. Um, the other problem, the other complexity around this idea of just let's build more machines, this great idea that I've got, is really that that's actually a very expensive solution. When we think about the cost of, the cost of equipment, the cost of a room to install these things in, those projects can be very easily more than £4 million. Pounds. So very, very expensive to simply add more machines. So let's look at the second solution when we talk about reducing the amount of, of security questions that people get as they go through and check their passport. What do I mean there and how does that apply to radiation therapy? Well, in my mind, I think that's really what we're talking about with hyperfractionation. It's the ability to bring patients through that workflow with a reduced number of fractions. And the NHS has really been the thought leader, the global leader in hyperfractionation. We've shown within the NHS that for breast and for prostate, we can treat those effectively in five fractions, in some cases, in many cases. So the NHS has really been a trailblazer in hyperfractionation. But in my mind, when we, when we look at hyperfractionation, it's without a doubt the future of radiation therapy. 
there are still some uh, areas that we need to consider. I think it's even more important than ever that we bring high quality imaging to the ISIS center. We need to know where that tumor is if we're delivering such high doses. Motion management is in my mind more important than ever. And that last talk was, was touching on DIBH there, but understanding how the tumor is going to move and making sure that we're managing the motion of that tumor. Uh, and then thirdly there, and I'm not going to talk about this too much, but I think it's it's worth raising and just, just mentioning it. Fractionation was really always our way of reducing damage to healthy tissue. That's how we spared uh, dose to healthy tissue. So other initiatives, and there's a lot of focus out there today on flash radiation therapy, which uh, we still need to do a huge amount more work, but suggests that that might give you the same tissue sparing that we used to get with, with fractionation. So it's a very, very exciting time for hyperfractionated treatments. This third point, you know, I mentioned a little bit tongue in cheek, the idea of we'll just give all of the border force uh, people just more coffee, ask them to work faster. Now, that is absolutely categorically not the right answer for dealing with the radiation therapy backlog. And the APPG letter to the prime minister called this out specifically. Uh, in, they worded it as saying, however, we urge you to accept that the cancer backlog cannot be tackled by existing staff just working harder and by delegating responsibility down to trusts, as it appears to be the current thinking. Anybody that has ever spent any time in a radiation therapy department knows how hard our clinicians work. Asking them to simply work harder is absolutely not the answer to this problem. I think what we can do is really look at the workflow that we're implemented within radiation therapy today and ask ourselves, are there any efficiencies to be gained? Can we make it faster in any area? And I think if I look at the workflow, it breaks down to me in three major steps. There's patient setup, getting the patient into the room, getting the patient out of the room. That actually is the longest part of that treatment workflow. So it seems sensible to me that we tackle that bit. Can we look at that and see where the efficiencies might lie in patient setup? The second step, pre-treatment imaging, imaging the patient before we turn the radiation beam on. Um, that doesn't take a huge amount of time, but we need to be careful when we're bringing new imaging modalities, things like MR Linux, into the radiation therapy workflow, that we're not actually making this worse. And while there are some really significant benefits to MR Linux, I think they have a great place in the industry, we need to make sure that the workflow does not suffer as a result of those uh, imaging modalities. And then third and, uh, third and finally, the treatment step. And we know as we've pushed as an industry towards higher and higher dose rates, that the beam on time is actually a very small portion of the overall workflow. So I realize I've not really come to you here and suggested any form of solution. In reality, all I've done is I've taken one question at the start, which is how do we deal with the backlog? And I've just created more questions. I've just brought more questions to the table. And I think the four big ones fundamentally that we need to be answering are how do we improve the distribution of radiation therapy? How do we reduce the cost of radiation therapy? How do we best enable the adoption of hyperfractionation and help to push that forward? And then how can we bring efficiencies into the workflow and reduce setup times uh, for patients today? And I always like to quote physicists, being a physicist myself, I always like uh, to quote physicists wherever possible. And I think this is a brilliant one in saying that if we are prepared to innovate, if we are prepared to think outside of the box, to use a cliche, there is always a better way and we just need to be open enough to find it and i think that for me at leo cancer care is is our main driver we are driving to find a better way and we believe that that better way could come in the form of fixed radiation beams and upright treatments within radiation therapy what you're seeing on screen here now is uh, a design from Leo Cancer Care for an upright uh, photon radiotherapy system. 
that utilizes a fixed radiation beam, a fixed 6 MV FFF radiation beam. Uh, and rather than rotating that beam around a patient, we simply very slowly rotate the patient in front of that radiation beam. It allows us to deliver a very compact and integrated treatment device encompassing uh, onboard integrated CBCT and high quality uh, radiation delivery. Having moving away from this idea of rotating a radiation source around a patient enables us to really start questioning the fundamentals of radiation protection and radiation shielding. Rather than needing very, very thick primary shielding 360 degrees around the radiation beam, that fixed system allows you to reduce that to one directional fixed primary radiation shielding and secondary shielding everywhere else. And that way of thinking, this change in the way that we're constructing these radiotherapy systems actually allows us to push forward with the idea of self-shielded uh, photon delivery. The idea of bringing all of the radiation shielding into the device itself, not the idea of having a specially designed radiation bunker. And I'm gonna to touch on now how I believe this core technology, this core innovation within the industry will allow us to tackle some of those questions that I raised. So let's go through them. I touched upon the question of how do we improve the distribution of radiation therapy? And I want to talk very briefly about a case study in South Wales where this is being addressed right now. Uh, we identified that patients in North Gwent is about 45 minutes, I believe, from Cardiff. Those patients are having to travel a significant distance every single day to receive their radiation therapy. So it's a fantastic initiative to actually build a satellite center at Neville Hall, which lies in between these two places. And that's been done so that those patients will have to travel less. It will improve their access to high quality care and therefore save more lives. This is a fantastic initiative. But I think the challenge is broader than just North Gwent. And this is not just something isolated to South Wales. This is a global issue that we're talking about. There are a number of other places, and these are just randomly jotted on points, that would be also 45 minutes away from both of those locations. So while we've solved the problem there for North Gwent, we've not solved the problem globally uh, with access to radiation therapy. So what do we do? How do we move forward and what, what does this bring us after North Gwent? Is this a case where we go and we build just more satellite centers, more and more and more and more, until all patients are only traveling a distance that's acceptable to high quality care? Or is there a better way? You know, can we open our minds and think outside of the box and challenge this idea of a conventional satellite center? I mentioned the idea of being able to integrate radiation shielding into fixed beam photon solutions. Well, what that really enables us to do is look at then putting those devices onto the back of mobile units and creating effectively the ultimate satellite center. And this is incredibly valuable if we start to think about five treatment hyperfractionated breast and prostate, where you could imagine taking this system and parking it in each of these locations for a week and treating your hyperfractionated patients in that site before moving to the next one. This is exactly what we do with diagnostics. Why not think outside of the box and push the same for treatment devices? So next, let's look at how I think we can reduce the cost of radiation therapy and how fixed beam systems can play into this. Well, when we typically think about the cost associated with a new radiation therapy project, we think about two main buckets of cost. We think about the equipment costs, where I truly believe that fixed beam systems and moving away from the complexity of rotating from anything from six tons to 600 tons of radiation equipment around the patient, and instead moving towards a simpler device with less rotation, it will without a doubt reduce equipment costs. What I'm showing on here on screen is the more significant cost reduction, which is really on the surrounding infrastructure. 
What you're seeing here is a floor plan from our research partner at Centre Leon Barard in, in France. And you can see they have two existing radiation therapy bunkers. And in the centre of that radiation, of those two bunkers, they have what was effectively an old mould room. This was not a CT sim room, this was not a shielded bunker, this is simply effectively an old storage room. And we are able to go into these kind of spaces, these small footprints, and deliver 6 MV uh, radiation therapy equipment for research purposes only here. Uh, this is not a CE marked product, but I think it really shows the possibilities that come from fixed radiation beams. But I also think it's very important that we think beyond just those two typical buckets of cost and we look at total cost of ownership. And this includes power and cooling, which also plays into carbon footprint as well. And not rotating these devices around a patient will without a doubt reduce the cost associated with powering them and cooling them. Also the complexity of doing so. Uh, making these devices simpler and taking all of the complex devices that typically rotate around the patient, if they're always fixed in one location, it's much easier for a service engineer to, to walk straight up to them and fix them, without a doubt reducing service and maintenance costs. It's also far easier to install these devices and commission them because they are much, much simpler and only operate at one beam angle from a radiation point of view. So then moving on to the next question of how do we best deal with hyperfractionation and how can we push forward with this area of the industry? And the biggest question the one I asked right at the start was how can we reduce motion? And institutions from all over the world, some of the biggest names in radiation oncology, have published papers showing that upright positioning can significantly reduce motion for all of these indications. Uh, I'm going to touch on just one of them uh, here, just in the interest of time, which is lung cancer. MD Anderson published a paper on uh, the benefits of treating lung cancer patients in the upright orientation and showed a significant reduction in breathing motion, four to five millimeters, that comes from having patients upright versus supine. And this reduction is really due to lung volume. We all know if anyone's ever been to see the opera, that an opera singer will be as upright as they possibly can because your lungs are more inflated. The diaphragm drops and increases the volume of the lung. For the same tidal volume of air, that increase in lung volume results in a reduction in breathing motion. The other point that I touched on is, is how do we bring better quality imaging to the ISIS center? Now, this is not for photons that we're talking about here, but actually we're also releasing technology into the particle therapy space and collaborating with existing proton therapy vendors. But what we're able to do in the particle therapy space is open up the space around the ISIS center dramatically. And it would be very difficult to integrate diagnostic quality MR or diagnostic quality dual energy CT into a rotating structure for particle therapy. But with a fixed radiation beam, it's very easy to do so. And bringing, as we are, diagnostic dual energy CT to the ISA center allows us to really use proton therapy at its full capability. So finally, how do we reduce treatment times? Well, I just wanted to show a very, very simple cartoon here uh, of the treatment workflow that we go through today. So we know that whether it was upright or whether it was supine, the first step is to bring the patient into the treatment room and have them sit either on an upright positioning system or a table. But on the right hand side, you see that the first step is actually the last step. This patient is now in the treatment position and ready to treat. Of course, we have to add a mobilization on, but that's the same in both cases. But what you see on the left hand side is this step where two therapists will come in. One will support the back of the patient and one will support the legs of the patient as we rotate the patient and lie them down. At that point, they're both ready for immobilization. So as I said, that's the same in both cases and the beam comes on. And then the same on the way out of the system as well. And a fantastic paper that was published by Keio University in Tokyo in Japan showed that the amount of time to initiate radiation, in this case for imaging, 
was exactly the same, supine and upright. No difference in the time required to press the buttons and turn the beam on, but the time required to set a patient up was roughly twice in the supine uh, orientation than you would see in the upright orientation. So a significant workflow efficiency can be harnessed through the use of upright positioning. So in summary, I really believe we face a significant challenge with this treatment backlog. And I think it's the time now to really think clever, to think outside the box and be innovative. We utilize mobile diagnostic systems incredibly effectively within the NHS. The use of fixed radiation beams and rotating patients enables us to move to a completely new paradigm shift where we can utilize mobile radiation therapy systems to take the distribution and to take radiation therapy to places it has never been before. On top of that, there may be also significant clinical advantages to the use of upright positioning. Significant reduction in motion has been reported by some of the biggest institutions in the world today. And thirdly and finally, health economics is more important now than it has ever been before. If COVID has taught us anything or shown us anything, it's that healthcare budgets are going to be scrutinized across the globe. And the use of fixed beam radiation therapy systems are a fantastic way of reducing the cost of radiation therapy and improve, improving patient throughput efficiencies. So again, thank you very much uh, for the presentation, uh, for, for uh, listening in. I've been more than happy to take any questions. Hi, Stephen. A great presentation. Uh, thank you very much for that. I'm just going to launch the poll for the audience. Uh, and whilst that poll's uh, loaded in, uh, we'll go for a question. Um, uh, so a question from here, here from Luke, uh, Stephen. Uh, well presented, Stephen. Uh, when talking about North Gwent, were your conversations mainly with uh, Belindra or sites like Neville Hall? So we've had a number of conversations with players in the industry there, uh, in both parties. Uh, and it's not, you know, I'm not pointing out that project down in the south of Wales to say this is a terrible idea, it's being run wrong. It's just a fantastic case study to show how I think we really need to progress and think outside the box with the idea of satellite centres. It's very restrictive to go and put equipment in one location, uh, especially as we move into hyperfractionation and we question whether we actually need more radiotherapy systems. I think it's just becoming more and more important the improved distribution rather than improved absolute numbers. Fantastic. Hopefully that answers uh, your question there, Luke. Um, as it needs uh, reducing shield shielding requirements, do you need a qualified radiographer to use the equipment, or is there an option to train other members uh, other members of staff in using it? That's an incredible question. That's exactly the sort of idea that allows us to push forward. Uh, with the industry. Right now, I would not be in a position where I would say we would go and change this and now it wouldn't be qualified radiographers, but that's the kind of thinking that brings progress to ask those sort of questions. You know, do I think that um, improvements in artificial intelligence will enable simpler use of these devices? I think is the, probably the first question. Absolutely. I think, you know, our goal is to make the delivery of radiation therapy as, 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 uh, as simple as possible. And we're really pushing to try and do that. I think as, as you move towards the idea of self-shielded systems that could potentially be put in, um, you know, pharmacies almost in, in 20, 30 years time, I think the possibilities are really endless with this technology. It really opens up a, a great number of doors. And that kind of questioning and, and thought is essential to be able to drive this industry forward. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, and just one final question before we move on, Stephen. Um, has the equipment been FDA approved? Not to this stage, no. So we do have uh, a research unit that is installed at Centre Leon Barad, one of the leading cancer institutes uh, in Europe. We have a number of other projects that we're actively engaged with in the United States uh, and in Europe, as well as Asia. We are um, going through the development process. We are very, very late stage in the development process. But we, as we are today at this date, this product is not FDA approved. It's also not CE marked. 
Thank you for answering that. Um, Stephen, fantastic presentation. Uh, just a final one. Are we okay to share the slides post-event? Absolutely. Yeah, no problem. Fantastic.